Hello, I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this week's Café Pause. Each week, we check in with a Berlin-based journalist to talk about the emerging stories and breaking news. And today, I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Melissa Eddy. She is the Berlin correspondent for the New York Times, and she's with us today in a personal capacity. Melissa has been reporting from Germany since 2000, and I can hardly think of a better person to help us measure the pulse of what is going on in Germany today. Hello, Melissa. Welcome Hi, back uh, to the Café Pause. It is great to see you. Thank you. It's good to be here. So it has been a little while um, since you and I spoke. I was looking through my notes and saw that it was actually in, in January that, that you and I talked last. Um, in the meantime, you've, you've got a new beat. And of course, I'd like to talk about the German economy and the European economy. But before we do that, um, let's, let's I, I would love to get your take on what the mood is like in Germany, um, in Berlin, right? Yesterday was the second advent, so a festive time, but there are some dark clouds, continue to be some dark clouds in Germany. What's what's sort of the atmosphere like? Um, I would say a subdued festiveness would be the way I, I would sum it up. Um, advent, of course, is, is quite popular, but Germans are really feeling the pinch of inflation this year. So the willingness to spend for Christmas already, we're hearing uh, that consumers are not opening up their wallets. Uh, and this was a year, of course, uh, that all of the shops and all were looking for a big return to spending after the lockdown. You know, the Christmas market, we call them advent markets are what they actually are. They run up until Christmas. Uh, reopened fully for the first time in two years. And so the hope was that everyone would be out and be festive. And at the same time with the war going on in Ukraine, uh, there's a whole squabble of how many Christmas lights should even be up. And everyone is keeping their thermostats down or is being encouraged to, or they're doing it simply because they're afraid of what their gas bill will be as the price of energy, the price of heating has quadrupled or more uh, since this time last year. And at the same time, there's almost sort of a weariness with this year, which for Germans has been a year of change. And all German watchers like yourself know that Germans are not always big fans of change. So it's uh, it's been a lot thrown at them. And, you know, at the same time, there is an awareness that compared to what Ukrainians are going through, uh, you know, what Germans are being asked to do is is kind of small potatoes. But it's still, um, it's, it's change and it's a lot. So um, subdued festiveness. Mm -hmm. I, that that sounds like probably a good way good way to describe it. You know, it was interesting listening to you talk a little bit and and sort of the the hope for for big returns um, in sort of sales uh, at at stores in the run up to Christmas, but also the the advent markets. Um, one of the things that I've been seeing in a number of news reports has just been um, the rising cost of things like a bratwurst or a glühwein um and that undoubtedly has dampened some of the enthusiasm around those those christmas markets and and advent markets as well absolutely costs are going up everything you know the price to produce anything because you need energy to produce it the price of energy has gone up so you have that element but also the price of raw materials has gone up um foodstuff prices have gone up you know with ukraine literally being europe's breadbasket although a lot of the grain for example does not go to europe there was enough of it um that does already we're seeing brewers now who are talking about you know they aren't able to get hops that they depended on coming from ukraine uh and so overall, just the price pressure that has been created by the war uh, is reflected in prices. And at the same time, people are are worried about are they going to be able to meet their basic expenses as inflation um, continues to rise. It did dip slightly in November. We went from 11.6 uh, in October down to 11.3 in mm -hmm. November, but it's still, you know, well into double digit inflation. And it's something Germans have not been been used to, Europeans for that matter, uh, for, for quite a few years. 
So I, I'd certainly like to come back to um, the questions around inflation and um, concerns about economic stagnation. But be before we do that, um, you know, this week uh, will mark the one year anniversary of the new government of, of Olaf Scholz in office um, of the traffic like like coalition, the Ampel Coalition of, of three parties. And so I'm I'm assuming that mixed in um, sort of with this with this sort of subdued festiveness um, and sort of your assessment on what's going on um, in Germany, there have also been sort of some um evaluations of the first year of of this government can you talk a little bit about how um the traffic light coalition and and how specifically olaf scholz are perceived at this this one year mark um sure so i would take everybody back a year to the famous selfie when this coalition got together and you even have to remember that the last Merkel coalition started out with her attempting to put together um, a conservative coalition with the Greens and the FDP. The FDP, FDP pulled out. So when the traffic light looked like it was going to succeed, they managed to, to go through all their ne negotiations relatively quickly and quite successfully. There was a lot of hope riding on the shoulders of, of this government. And then within weeks of them taking power, of course, um, the invasion, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine by Russia happened, and Schultz pronounced this Zeitenwende, this epochal change, um, which, as um, Agnes Marie Strack-Zimmermann was saying uh, just last week to us, you know, when people are like, wait, where is this, where is this change? We're not seeing it. Um, these things take time. And... Um, one of the changes I would say that is more subtle that is being seen in Germany is this understanding that the use of force might not always be a negative. You know, post-World War II Germans, especially from the West, have been so drilled into this idea of pacifism, war at no cost, are suddenly realizing that defending yourself or defending a nation um, can actually have some some value. Now, that being said, you know, we still see the spats going on around arming Ukraine and sending what level of defense into Ukraine. Um, that has definitely weighed on this government. But what we're also seeing is that as the focus now, you know, nearly we're heading up into what, 10 months, nearly a year into, into dealing with how to handle the response to the war in Ukraine. Um, suddenly some of the domestic issues are starting to raise up. Uh, the health minister is under tremendous pressure. Uh, I was actually in an ER last night with my nephew who has RSV and the doctors were just saying how overwhelmed they are and that after COVID, they had hoped that the government would see the need for reforms in the health system. And now they find themselves back in the same position again. And I didn't even do my journalist number on this guy. He was just so frustrated that an open ear asking a couple of interested questions about how they were coping um, really spoke volumes to me about the extent to which um, Karl Lauterbach, who is also not particularly... Um, popular among some of his fellow ministers is really under pressure as, you know, COVID waves are starting to tick up a little bit. And also we see a tremendous number of kids uh, who are needing to be hospitalized. So that's definitely going to put the, the this government under a bit more pressure. Um, the FDP also seems to be increasingly unhappy. Uh, there's a lot of sort of side swiping about different ministers, Lauterbach, um, the defense ministers coming under pressure. And there is a certain element of questioning, can Olaf Scholz hold this together? And then to not leave out the Greens, um, you know, there's a certain level of disappointment between uh, among some true Green supporters that Habeck has had to go from promising, you know, mass conversion to, to climate friendly energy to needing to do LNG deals with Qatar to spending billions to set up new floating liquefied natural gas terminals and the idea of extending the nuclear reactors, which ultimately fell to Schultz, um, was not hugely popular either. So it, I think as we head into this kind of festive season, people are willing to 
stop and and take a breath. But in mm-hmm. the new year, the the new government is well new. They won't be as new, but the current the UMPL, the traffic light government is really they're going to be under pressure on a lot of these different fronts. Where I think they're going to be expected to to deliver for Germans, um, in addition to delivering for Ukraine. Do you have any concerns that this government might not hold? Not at the moment. Um, I feel like everyone understands the extent to which Germany going down at this moment would just drag all of Europe down and be completely detrimental to to Germany as a whole um, and, and to the European project. And I feel like that awareness amongst those in office is strong enough that they will find a way to limp along um, if if they have to because because they have to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, I mean, in, in you know, like in the states, I think that there's we're we're so used to there being that 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 constant fractiousness between the Republicans and the Democrats. It's almost like who can remember you know when when collaboration was was just kind of normal and not you know front page news and germany is not at that point you know they can squabble and everybody grandstands a bit to make their headlines but at the end of the day the idea that the need for consensus on all fronts at this time is so important mm-hmm. um and already we're seeing you know berlin messed up their elections just simply because berlin is a chaotic mess right and they're having to go through new campaigning and all. And I think looking at that and what that has meant um, has sort of struck a bit of the fear of new elections into anyone who might have thought that could be a good idea. Yeah, I mean, there certainly does not seem to be an appetite for new elections, um, both within the government, but also within the opposition. And there isn't really much of an alternative, right? I mean, if this government doesn't hold um, even if there was a, a CDU-led government uh, at the moment, it certainly seems as if the Christian Democrats and the Greens are pretty far apart on a lot of the, the issues that they would need to come together on, even though there is um, some precedent for state-led governments of Christian Democrats and Greens. But you know, the, Right, the, but I think the, the personalities that we're seeing between Friedrich Merz and Jens Spahn against Habeck and Baerbock, for example. Yeah. I would say at this stage of the game, there's no way that that would work together. Yeah. No, like there's zero interest from either side. Um, yeah. And there are also just politically not enough crossover points. Yeah. And so there's just there's just no appetite for that. So this this government has to hold. But but as you say, we will see this government coming under increasing pressure um, in in the new year. Um, and so yeah. it will be it, it will certainly be very interesting to watch that. Um, you had talked a little bit about the the impact of the war in Ukraine on Germany and um, sort of the the level of support, um, but also the level of hardship that German citizens are facing. And one of our viewers, John Chamberlain, has a, a question for you related to that. So I'm actually going to unmute his mic and let him um, ask his question. So John, you're you're on the line. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, uh, Melissa and Stephen. Thank you very much. This is a great timing. So, Melissa, my question is: um, the there's been sort of various, I guess, reports coming from Germany about the level of support, public support for continued sanctions on Russia for the hardships that Germans are going to face this winter. With you mentioned the, you know, the Christmas markets. There's even a question of should they have the lights, as many lights on. Um, so there's definitely a. a a feeling of the war and sacrifices that's being felt in Germany much more acutely than, for example, in the United States. Um, what's your sense of of how much support there is? And maybe talk about like East versus West Germany. I, I think there's more um, kind of pro-Russian sentiment in the East and what impact might that have um, on, on the this Germany's support for continued tough line on Ukraine going forward? Thank you. Thanks, John. Um... So overall, I would say the support remains solid. Um, Now, that being said, the government is definitely supportive of Ukraine, of maintaining sanctions. You know, today we see that the EU embargo on shipped 
Russian oil uh, takes into effect. Um, and that um, has been somewhat controversial. Interestingly enough, uh, one of the places that is hardest hit is actually in East Germany and normally could get pipeline oil. Um, this, the refinery in Schwedt, uh, which is about two hours outside of Berlin, but supplies uh, Berlin with all of its jet fuel, all of its diesel, and all of its gasoline. So actually for the capital, it's incredibly critical. And the, they, it was owned by, it was uh, partially owned by a, a Russian oil company and received the bulk of its oil through the Druzhba, the Friendship Pipeline. Now, the government inter intervened, took over uh, the refinery a couple months ago, and now they're trying to get oil shipped in either through Poland or through Rostock, and it's just not enough. Uh, I was up there in the area last week, and um, there's a lot of resentment in the East, um, specifically in that town, because it's an industry town, it's a refinery town. But what surprised me is people were saying it feels like 1989 all over again. We had just gotten used to a system that worked, being the reunification capitalist system, found their way in there, and now that is being disrupted. And I think that same sentiment is kind of clear across the board in the East, where because they went through this monumental change within, you know, living memory, uh, the idea of the change that is being forced by cutting ties to Russia, not only the energy ties, which are critical, uh, there's another plant that relies on natural gas that had come from Russia to make fertilizer, to make add blue. And again, just the way that Eastern Germany is set up, you had these these cities that are they exist around you know these big industrial complexes, whether an oil refinery or this um, chemical plant, and um, or even a porcelain factory, where losing the gas, the energy that is necessary, puts an entire community at risk. And so, trying to find um, new paths of employment and trying to reassure those people in the east. Uh, that they still have a future is going to be really critical uh, for this government. And at the same time, those same places are the places that are most um, susceptible to anti-foreigner sentiment. And where we saw um, in February, March, a lot of Germans mobilizing to take in Ukrainian refugees. As the Ukrainians uh, face an ever colder winter, you know, their energy infrastructure has basically been destroyed, the fear is in Europe and specifically in Germany, because Poland is so saturated, that you're going to get more refugees coming into Germany, the costs are going to go up, and the Germans who were willing to support those refugees a year ago are kind of still doing it, and they're exhausted, and prices have gone up. And so there is a certain fear of that same backlash that we saw in 2015, 2016 against the refugees that came in from the Middle East, by and large. Um, that although initially the Ukrainians were accepted as fellow Europeans, fellow Christians, they were easier, if you will, for Germans to accept, um, that that sentiment is gone and we could see more tensions rising up there. Um, and that is particularly within the East, although there are also communities in the West where, you know, you just, you have, you, you've reached the, you've reached a tipping point. There are actually quite a few more refugees here than we've been writing about. Uh, because so far it hasn't been a problem, but the fear is, is as we as we head into winter, the double strain of the inflation, the lack of energy for Germans. If you get more people coming in, straining those already expensive limited resources here, it could really it could really tip things um, economically. So far, most industry understands that doing business with Russia is just not an option. Um, German. Firms have been incredibly supportive of firms in Ukraine. Um, there are obviously still pockets and individuals that are saying, you know, let this war get over with so we can return to business as usual with Russia because those ties are deep and long and you have a lot of companies um, that would like to, to be able to revive that. At the same time, the longer this goes on, the, the sort of deeper the realization is that, that that is not necessarily going to be possible. Melissa, since you were um, talking ab about Poland, um, another uh, another one of our viewers is curious um, how Poland views um, 
sort of the sentiment in Eastern Germany that seems to be a little bit more pro-Russian um, than the West German sentiment and how concerned people in Poland are about um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and whether sort of the Poles feel feel pinched um, and what sort of an impact that has on the relationship between Berlin and Warsaw. Um, I would say that right now Poland is facing an election next year. And we saw uh, just in the past couple of weeks where after the missile hit into Polish territory, the initial reporting came out that it was Russia intentionally fired it. Later, it was scaled back to, you no, know, it looks like it was stray and it came from Ukraine. Uh, there are a lot of conspiracy theories flying around um, in Germany um, about that being a cover-up. Uh, and and questioning why is is uh, the West trying to cover that up? Um, in Poland, however, the Germans offered to send Patriot missiles over to Poland to help allow them to be able to better protect their border. And the Poles suddenly said, "We don't want them." The initial reaction, interestingly, from the Polish minister uh, was great. You know, thank you. This shows great German Polish ties. And then uh, the head of the peace party. Uh, that is in charge, uh, decided, no, we don't want that. Germany is just, you know, should be sending it to Ukraine and not to us, and basically was ginning up anti-German sentiment. And I think uh, it looks like Poland, the you know, the, the conservative party is more interested in remaining in power and using Germany as a punching bag in order to drum up some, you know, populist, nationalist, anti-German German, um, sentiment against the Germans then then cooperating, which that could be detrimental, you know, to this this whole effort, because I think in general, the Germans have really respected what the Poles have done in terms of the number of refugees that they have taken in. And Poland has been a key point for people coming and going from Ukraine. Um, even firms that say there's a, you know, there's a big movement um, amongst industrial companies to send parts, whether it be generators, whether it be transformers, whether it be like wire into Ukraine to help them be able to repair their damaged energy systems as quickly as pos possible. And one of the launching points to make that happen is through Poland. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they almost, you know, they, they, the Germans understand the role that Poland is in and, um, so I think that they're being more cautious um, as far as how the polls feel. Um, I don't have a good handle in all honesty on, on what public sentiment is, but there is a concern that, you know, politically uh, there seems to be a willingness to, to turn against Germany right now. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I'd like to, in a moment, sort of drill down a little bit more on, on the German economy, which you've touched on a couple times during our conversation today. But but first, an, another viewer submitted this question, which I think provides a good segue. Um, he writes, you raised an interesting point regarding German firms which have Russian operations. U.S. companies have literally closed and terminated their Russian operations. What have German firms done? Have they minimized activity? Have they temporarily suspended activity? Or have they completely closed shop and, and left? For the most part, they've completely closed shop and left. Um, there are some firms that have maintained a certain level of ties. For example, uh, agriculture medicines, which are not under the sanctions regime. regime. There are, um, I, I, I'm not going to name names because I'm not solid enough and I don't want to misquote, but I think there's some big chemical or pharmaceutical companies that are continuing to sell needed um, medicines to Russia. Um, also, you know, Germany had several agricultural companies that really helped industrialize agriculture in Russia over the past 30 years. Uh, potato planting, for example. Uh, there's a German, there's a couple of German companies that um, made uh, big agricultural equipment that helped industrialize the the whole harvesting and planting of the potato crop, which used to be done more or less by hand in people's dachas. And so they have maintained um, not fully active ties, but they haven't closed down all of their um, operations in Russia, again, with this idea that they set up operations there. They need to, to be able to maintain them. Uh, car companies, for example, however, VW, um, which had big operations there, 
have have not sold off their operations yet, but they've basically closed them down. You know, in many cases, we were hearing about uh, Western companies like car makers, where they were really worried that um, people who who worked for them had been called up in the mm-hmm. latest recall. So it has not been across the board as clear cut as American companies pulling out, especially with some of the smaller companies. But uh, a lot of the largest companies have uh, severed ties to to a very very large extent, and obviously everyone is aware of the sanctions and they're. So far, we've not seen a lot of attempts by German firms. Um, we've not seen any attempts by German firms to sort of go around that, those sanctions. So, so Melissa, you know, you talked a little bit earlier about sort of the the pinch of inflation that normal citizens are are feeling. Um, obviously, there are inflationary trends that are affecting businesses as well. The prices of raw materials are going up. There are supply chain disruptions. Um, and yet some of the concerns about inflation seem to be be dampening a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about sort of how concerned the German economy is about inflationary trends move, moving forward? Um, how concerned people are about possible economic stagnation because of some of the limited market access that you were just talking about? Sure. Um, so the big question is, is you know, has peak inflation been reached yet. Um, For the Eurozone, Lagarde was saying last week, she doesn't believe it has. Uh, Germany did see this turnaround where there was this dip um, in inflation from October to November, month on month. But it's not entirely clear yet whether that was an anomaly. You know, we'll see when when December comes out, um, or or whether that is an indication of a new trend. Uh, certainly, the supply chain pressures are real. German Germans are, you know, the German economy, German industry is incredibly globalized. They've also been very hit uh, by China's decision to maintain these widespread uh, lockdowns from the spread of the coronavirus there. So the interesting thing that we're seeing in the German economy is that the order books still remain full. And, um, you know, there's the IFO um, business sentiment survey uh, that that takes place every month. And for the first time, that rose unexpectedly and more than expected. So there seems to be sort of a sentiment that some of the tremendous shocks from the energy crisis have been absorbed and adjustments are being made. Um, we do have the, I think, three LNG floating terminals that uh, are set to go in, I'm going to say within the next six to eight weeks, mm-hmm. which could help ease some of the pressure on the price of energy um, to get Germany through the winter, which industry has been you know, massively hit um, by the price of, of energy. Um so that, in terms of the the pressures uh, that could that could ease a bit of the energy price pressure. At the same time, um, we've seen you know the BDI, um, the biggest so- German industrial association, said the biggest fear is especially for some of the smaller and mid sized companies that prices are are gonna they're gonna get really squeezed with the the prices and that they're looking to move their operations elsewhere because. They could end up, you know, saving, you know, I guess it was 20%, they surveyed 600 companies and 20% of them said that uh, they were seriously thinking of moving operations elsewhere. And um, so there are fears within industry that overall inflation in Germany and prices in general will remain too high and uh, that in order, it, it just, it won't. They, it won't make it be profitable anymore. Uh, they may end up moving to places like Slovakia, Poland, um, Hungary, elsewhere within the EU, where you have already a lot of subsidiaries of German companies um, that are active, but still that's going to hit the German industrial sector. And I think the coming year will be a real year of reckon- reckoning. Um, at the same time, there's been a lot of talk. You know, The German industrial sector in many ways remained very stuck in the previous century. Digitization, Germans are so weird about, you know, their, you know, their fears of Daten Schutz, their data protection, and and where the United States embraced uh, you know, the internet and and digitization wholeheartedly, Germans have been much more reluctant. Um, 
and and they you know that has got to change now and i think in some cases the certain this the crisis situation we're facing now could give germans the impetus that they need to change because often you know history has kind of shown that that germans take their time but once they make up their mind to do it they do it with great efficiency and speed and um the coming years definitely 20 you know 2000 Three, uh, 2023, 2024 will really kind of show if if Germany's going to be headed into a new traje trajectory or if it's like back to sick man of Europe sort of territory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the, the coming year um, is going to be a real test um, for, for Germany, for the German economy on multiple levels. Um, we had an event recently with with Ben Hodges and and he was saying that this winter is the last winter that Russia will be able to hold Germany hostage when it comes to energy um making it sort of sound like next year things look better in my mind though it has a lot to do with whether or not Germany actually has the infrastructure in place so that it has the energy sources and resources that it needs in order to drive the economy Right, because this winter was the last winter that Germany was a was able to draw from Russian gas. So even right. though they paid, you know, enormous prices from it, when they first started restocking their completely depleted um, gas storage facilities, it, it was originally with the gas that was still coming through through Nord Stream One. Right, um, and that went on until July, where they were at full capacity or nearly full capacity, and then it was scaled back until se September. And then I can't believe I'm forgetting this, but whenever you know the the the, the lines were attacked and severed, it stopped entirely. But so there September, are a lot of fears. Sorry, September, I think. September, end of September. Um, but there's a lot of fears that if the LNG is um, you know is not enough, and because the whole pipeline network for natural gas in Europe is set up for flows to go from the east to the west. And they're still trying to get that reversed. Germany and France did do a deal where um, some of the natural gas that is the LNG gas that is able to come into France can now be transmitted to Germany. That had never been possible mm -hmm. until a couple of months ago. Um, but so it's kind of a double edged sword. This, yes, Russia will no longer be able to hold it hostage, but can Germany actually get enough gas without Russian gas is the big question. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people already this winter are concerned about that, okay, it looks like, you know, we had a mild start to the winter, all the storage facilities are full. It looks like right now Germany will get through the winter without severe, you know, having to go through any kind of um, emergency measures without blackouts. But then what happens next year is is, is already looming over people's minds, both, you know, individuals and businesses as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So since we're talking about the, the economy, um, one of our, our viewers acknowledges that while inflation and, and interest rates are, are up, um, in both Germany and the U.S., there are solid employment numbers, there are solid sales numbers. Shouldn't that offset this narrative about um, recession and an ac economic downturn? Um, yes, it should, although just because you have a couple of other anomalies like the energy crunch. So already because of that, um, Germany is projected to probably go into a recession at the start of next year. Uh, it might be able to get out of that, depending. This is sort of the, you know, the, the energy question is the wild card. Uh, the the strong wages, the strong or the strong jobs has definitely a, a more mitigating effect. And then we also saw IG Metall, you know, Germany's powerful metal workers union, was able to strike a deal for new wages. It's a two-year deal, and the the you know percentage, the increased percentage that, that they struck was below the level inflation. So we're not looking at um, a wage increase spiral. So there is we're avoiding that. Um, so yeah, the narrative sounds good, but the numbers on the ground. Um, especially if energy remains tight 
and and highly expensive. And you have to look across all of Europe for this as well. You know, Germany is also being hit by the fact that half of France's nuclear reactors are offline because this means that France needs more energy, more mm -hmm. electrical power, and it draws it from Germany. So overall, there's less in the system. Also, Ukraine is now connected to the wider European electricity network, which means electricity powered in the North Shore of Germany, in theory, could be sent all the way down and transmitted to Ukraine. Um, part of Russia's strategy in taking, you know, the big nuclear reactor offline down in Ukraine was that for a couple of months before that happened, Ukraine was actually able to export power to Europe, uh, make money off of it, and and help ease this energy crunch in in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. So the energy, the energy crunch situation and how that plays out is, is one of the biggest wild cards because it's really the inflated price of, of energy that has driven inflation so high around here. Yeah. Thank More so than in the United States as well, since the US yeah. is, you know, an, an exporting energy an energy exporter. And and you know, Germany definitely is not. Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. I'd like to to sort of try to pick out two more topics before we we wrap up, if you will. The, the first one is, um, I'd like to ask you about, about the German response to Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. Um, in recent weeks, we've seen some criticism from people like Robert Habeck, but also Lars Klingbeil, the head of the SPD, after he came back from a trip to the U.S. Um, just over the weekend, the European Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, um, also talked about this sort of very controversial act uh, and express some concern um, in Europe. What I'm hearing is is people are concerned about American protectionism, particularly in sort of the renewable energy sector as it relates to uh, electric vehicles uh, and green technologies. Uh, and it's almost as if they're they're threatening to. Um, have their own protectionist policies, with the French calling for a bi European act, um, if you if you will. But it seems as if both Washington, Berlin, Brussels certainly want to avoid a trade war. Can you help us sort of unpack this this German response to the the Inflation Reduction Act? I'll I'll give it my best shot. Um, so I think. First of all, the psychological impact of the idea that Biden was going to be different from Trump and uh, Trump, you know, who who had all of these protectionary measures uh, and that the Europeans then, you know, like responded to with their own sanctions against, you know, Harvey Harleys and Levi's and whiskey. I mean, um, I think there was there was a real hope that they were turning the corner. And then now to see that, especially in these key sectors where Europe is also interested um, in industrial change in terms of green tech, batteries, EVs, uh, and looking to collaborate with the United States, what Germans are seeing is that uh, because of the inflated prices over here, it suddenly doesn't make sense for a lot of producers to be able to uh, produce things like car, you know, batteries, EVs. Uh, a concrete example, uh, Tesla put in its big gigafactory just outside of Berlin on the border to Brandenburg. They are making cars there, but they were supposed to also be making batteries. That has now been put on ice because it's much more advantageous to Tesla to produce those batteries in the United States. Um, and I think that has really frightened and frustrated Europeans, um, Germans in particular, also the French. And at a time where Germany and France can't get together on a lot of other issues, arming Ukraine, you know, there's the whole energy back and forth. Both of them are in agreement that pushing back against this American protectionism, whether it be through going to the World Trade Organization, whether it be through having Europe enact its own uh, protectionary measures, uh, they are completely in line with this. And so politically, they, they also need it. But economically, I think both of them are, are viewing it as, um, as, as a potential threat if, if so much production you know, remains in, in the United States versus being able to have the transatlantic trade that, that they've mm -hmm. seen. So, Melissa, of course, this this debate about industrial policy in Europe and the U.S. is kind of coming to a head just as the third meeting of the technology and the U.S. EU Technology and Trade Council takes place today in Washington D.C. Of course, this forum was 
was brought about um, after TTIP failed um, as a way of sort of rekindling the transatlantic economic relationship after the Trump years. Um, and yet it's 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 sort of overwhelmed by other issues that are are causing irritations. What are your expectations from today's uh, Trade and Technology Council meeting? I think, you know, having just spoken about these this you know, sort of deadlock that we're almost at right now over the Inflation Reduction Act. I think what um, the hope would be is that some progress could be made to find a way to take the worst of the sting out of it for Europeans and set the United States and in and and Europe as a whole back on more solid, you know, equal friendly trading territory. Um, I think there's also one of the problems, though, is that the Europeans don't fully understand the extent to which for the United States and for Biden, it is incredibly important domestic policy to really be able to deliver on his pledge to um, help revive domestic industry. Um, so my expectations, my expectations is that they actually talk to each other, but that they listen to each other mm -hmm. and, and begin to sort of map out a way forward on, on this issue that otherwise could really threaten to unravel uh, what has traditionally been an incredibly strong economic cooperation at a point also when both the United States and Europe are looking to pivot away from their dependence on China. Yeah. And that could be one key uh Habeck actually is down in Africa today. Germany is looking to diversify its supply chain also um, for rare earths, for other raw materials, and turning to Africa, turning to other parts of Asia. Um, but I think in terms of actual trade cooperation, they would like to be able to feel that they're moving together and not against the United mm -hmm. States. So I'm, I'm happy that you just raised China because that was the other point that I wanted to, to touch on and that we haven't really talked about today. And one of our, our viewers is curious whether you can explain some of the political motivations behind Olaf Scholz's decision to allow a minority Chinese ownership in one of the four port terminals in, in Hamburg. Um, as I think you know, this has caused a lot of questions here in the U.S. and some consternation. Do you have any insights on, on the rationale for it? I think it was purely political. You have to remember that Schultz was previously the governor slash mayor, because Hamburg is one of the city states, um, of Hamburg. And so his party is still, the Social Democrats are still in charge there. And... Um, the Chinese ambassador is quite influential with the current governor mayor, and the pressure was tremendous um, to maintain these ties right now at this point with China. Now, um, I know in the, you know, internal in the domestic and, and foreign intelligence communities, it was viewed as sending entirely the wrong signal uh, to all of Germany at a time when um when they're trying to, to pivot away from this dependence on China. Um, I think financially, the economic impact of, you know, it's not, it was only a, a small part. It wasn't like the port was sold. It's like mm -hmm. one part of one terminal. So economically, it wasn't that big of a deal, but the real danger um, is the fear that it sent entirely the wrong signal. Mm -hmm. And Schultz, her, my personal belief is he just caved into uh, political pressure because you can't forget that Schultz is, you know, always walking a bit of a tightrope within his yeah. own party. He is chancellor, and so the SPD is thrilled with him for that, but otherwise they're not particularly fond of the man. Yeah. And so his political capital still remains in, in his home turf, and that's where Hamburg is, and the current mayor was a very strong proponent of this, as was much yeah. of the business industry in Hamburg. Yeah. But the optics just aren't aren't good. Um, the optics aren't good at all. And and like I said, there are those who were really frustrated ab about that because at a time when, you know, there's a real push to sort of be warning German companies about the dangers of becoming overly reliant 
on um, on China because of you know all of the issues that are out there that the United States is also concerned about and the Germans are only currently waking up to up until you know the implementation of five of the five G networks and the whole Huawei deal the Germans large by and large viewed China as just like one big economic you know market to to take part in and they didn't see any of the dangers. And by trying to warn them now of the dangers to have the chancellor make this signal entirely in the other direction, I think has been incredibly frustrating. Yeah. Well, Melissa, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, as, as an American living in Berlin, I'd like to ask you one, one final question that comes from, from one of our viewers um, who, who writes, given the inflationary trends that we're seeing, given the war in Ukraine, um, given the epical change of the Zeitenwende, how do Germans view the United States? Are we part of the average German's problem or are we part of the hope that things are getting better? Both. Depends on which German you're talking to. Um, I think the negativity towards the United States that was seen immediately after the Trump administration uh, has dissipated somewhat. I think there is a lot of respect in certain circles for the United States for its unwavering staunch support of Ukraine, its willingness to send whatever weapons they needed, and it's, you know, taking a leadership role. At the same time, there is still that strong sort of anti-American pull within uh, Germany. Um, and I would say on the climate front, you know, one thing we didn't bring up is the this radical last generation or increasingly mm -hmm. radical last generation climate protests that are taking place. That sort of cohort of society is, is more anti-American and... Um, so it's it's uh it's split. It really it it's less vehement anti-American than it's been for a while. Uh, but there is still a certain amount of suspicion, and I think there's a certain level of unease that okay, America now is is on the right track. But what happens in two years' time? Um, mm -hmm. Germans were really spooked, and I'm not even just talking about the personality of Dur of Donald Trump, but more. The idea that a democracy that that they by and large viewed as the world's democracy could be so shaken and so weakened um, really frightened a lot of people and left them also feeling a bit at sea. And that underlying sentiment has not completely been um, been been washed away. Mm -hmm. Well, Melissa, I want to thank you again for for taking the time to to talk with us today. This has been a, a I think, outstanding conversation. It's been um, incredibly informative, and I've really enjoyed uh, having the opportunity to talk with you again. So, so herzlichen Dank to Berlin. Many, many thanks. Sehr gerne. <laughs> and I wish you a a very warm and pleasant Adventszeit. Um, hopefully, not too troubled. Um, and I look forward to, to crossing paths with you again in the new year. We won't let it be another year. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. All right, that, that can be my new year's pledge to you. <laughs> okay, thank you All very right. much. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.